the purpose of this uh, first session is threefold. And we have three speakers that we are so excited to have with us here today. Uh, let me introduce the panel. First is Rachel Robinson, Deputy Commissioner of Minnesota Housing. Ms. Robinson will present an overview of the significant housing investment legislation that was passed this year. Second, I want to introduce Andrea Brennan, CEO of the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. Ms. Brennan will provide an overview of her organization's programs and how they can leverage the state's funding as well as our local private and public investment. And finally, our very own Amy Baldwin, uh, Community Development Director for Ottertail County. Ms. Baldwin will share how Minnesota Housing and the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund can bolster Ottertail County's current programs and attracting housing investment to Ottertail County. To each of you, a thank you for being with us here today. My first question is to Deputy uh, Commissioner Robinson, and I should ask, is it okay if I call you Rachel? Absolutely. Well, th <laughs> thank you for that. You can call me Commissioner Mortensen. <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Actually, it's Commissioner Vice Chair Mortensen. But <laughs> no, it's just Kurt. Um, so getting down to business, uh, can you start off with an overview of the historic level of investment in housing from this legislative session? All right, oh good, good and loud. Um, good morning everyone, I'm Rachel. And I have a slide presentation that's really dense. There is no quiz, and I'm definitely not gonna read it all to you. I think the plan is for you to have this resource, the slide deck, um, available to you. So if you wanna go back and reference, there's a lot of words, there's a lot of detail, numbers, um, and it's all really good information that might you know, come in handy when you're looking at doing a development in the future, um, but definitely not gonna sit here and read it off. Um, so don't feel like you have to take a picture, we'll, we'll get it to you. <laughs> um, so who are we at Minnesota Housing? We are the state housing finance agency. Every state has a one of us. Um, and our you know, view, our world value is that everyone deserves a you know, safe, decent home. And we do a lot of work in the policy and strategic planning area um, to make sure that our housing ecosystem in Minnesota is really healthy and that we're continuing to advance in all that we do. Um, housing is so foundational. There is just, you know, nothing else works for people if they do not know that they have a stable place um, to lay down their head every night. And, and that drives us every single day. And so, you know, we have a very bold vision um, to sum it up, it is to go big so everyone can go home. That is what we talk about all the time at Minnesota Housing. We are pushing 350 employees. We are growing really, really fast um, and uh, covering a huge spectrum of, of housing in the state. And the, the what we do, it really has changed. One of the things I put on the table over there is a link to our movie that our communications team put together. Um, it's a good long film, parts of it make me cry because it's just so beautiful to see what's possible when we put resources um, into something that everyone needs, which is a home. And we have really changed. You know, Housing agencies traditionally in the 1970s were formed uh, to do first mortgage lending for uh, first time home buyers and sell those loans on the secondary market or, or bonds. And um, since then we have grown to do so many things because we do rental and we do home ownership. We work on preventing and ending homelessness and we invest in manufactured home parks and policy work. Um, and we have a lot of new stuff that's really focused on local governments that I'll talk about um, today as well. Oh, I see, we've got, I gotta click a lot to make this happen, all right. Um, I was talking about the spectrum without showing you the spectrum slide. So. Um, so I'll talk a bit like more in detail without reading you this slide full of words, but um, these are the areas that we currently cover. Um, and I, you know, I think it's good to see like the whole manufactured housing bottom left quadrant, I spent a lot of time talking about that with uh, my table mate this morning, is new in the last five years to Minnesota housing. 
Um, a lot of the homelessness prevention work um, that we do and a lot of working with households on direct rental assistance, that's new in the last 10 years. So we've got a lot of things that are newer at Minnesota Housing. But at the end of the day, here's what we don't do. And I think this is where it's really important to focus because we are nothing without the people who actually build the housing, own the housing, run the programs, um, you know, leverage our resources at the local level. Um, we don't own anything. We don't run any housing. We are, we are not, you know, the real estate agent working with the home buyer. Um, we're out there supporting those efforts with our housing finance resources. So I mentioned going big so we can go home. Maybe you've seen a headline on this. Um, I love this graphic because it's really intense to think that um, as a state housing agency, we've always done about a billion and a half in work because we do first mortgage lending, we do multifamily lending. Um, but the state would appropriate a few tens of millions of dollars in a good year to the agency. And this year for housing, just in the world that we cover at Minnesota Housing, not that at Department of Human Services or DEED, $1.3 billion in resources. It's incredible. A lot of these are grants, and a lot of these are grants that are really meant to um, accelerate activity across greater Minnesota. So I'm very excited to be here because these numbers are really big and this graphic really highlights how fast we are going to grow in order to make this all happen. So the legislature made these commitments in a number of areas. Capital resources, that covers the whole spectrum of housing that was in the first slide. I didn't show you because I didn't click through it. Um, and the capital, it's about building, preserving. We also have uh, consider, considerable resources to help at the household level, level with housing stability, home ownership assistance, um, meaning the actual homeowners and direct assistance to get them into a home. Uh, so I'll just put up the big numbers that are in the copy of the slide. The little plus sign is what was new this year from what a typical budget year might look like. Um, and so, you know, where we've gone up or seen a really significant new investment. And we have existing programs and we have new programs. On the next slide, you'll, few slides, you'll see the same pattern here. Where we have existing programs, the agency already has a process for accepting applications and getting the resources out the door. Where it's new, we do have to, you know, I need staff, so I'm hiring, uh, you know, we need uh, program design, which often means talking to our stakeholders to make sure we make a program. You know, the legislature might give us three lines. We turn that into a 30-page book on how the, the resources will get out in the community. Um, and then we work with our colleagues at the intermediary organizations and elsewhere to, to make sure that we um, make those resources work in the community. Uh, in home ownership, um, we'll talk about this a bit in the question and answer too, but a lot of new money from the legislature in assisting home buyers who are buying the first home in their generation, um, or the first generation in their family, I guess, to buy a home. And housing stability, this is where we support households, um, both homeowners and renters, uh, in you know, remaining in their home, preventing homelessness, helping people through that crisis. Um, we have really significant resources. And you know, if you are working in the supportive housing realm, one of the things that the commissioner um, and I really pushed through this year was getting strengthening the supportive housing model. You know, really, how do we operate affordable, house, affordable housing where people need supportive services on a day-to-day -day when those operating costs have never been funded adequately um, in our industry. And then uh, other resources, you'll notice the new column is where things got really big. Um, there was a lot of excitement at the state government working with like the League of Minnesota Cities, League of Small Cities, the Association of Counties um, to address needs that have kind of built up, pent up across the state, uh, particularly in greater Minnesota communities. So again, this is way too much. I'm not going to spend much time on these, but about 750 million of that existing pool of programs are infused with capital that is getting out the door. If you have an open application with us in our single family impact fund, our multifamily consolidated program, manufactured housing, it's the week before December 15th-ish, that Thursday, the first Thursday in December, 
um, our packet will go live of what the agency is selecting, and this is the number we're working with. We got a huge response before we even knew we had $1.3 billion in applications, and we are um, going to be announcing what we're uh, choosing because we want to show the legislature we can spend this money, you can spend this money, we don't do any of the work, but that you can spend this money and that we can um, sustain this level of investment in housing in Minnesota. When we create new programs, there are these, these are often required steps. You know, this isn't just uh, Rachel deciding to make things a little bit more bureaucratic. Um, it's you know, there's uh, rules that govern how we set up new programs, uh, and most of the time it is a requirement of state law that we do a competition for the resources. So we set the rules of the competition. Really want that to be transparent, um, so that you can come into that with really good information on how you would set up a great proposal and, and get funded. This list is changing every day because there's a board meeting today where two more program guides are moving forward and we have programs under construction that are um, going to the board today. And so these, we're really trying to fill up that first column and um, you know, show that we can do this, that it's, it is scary, $1.3 billion, um, but I've gotten past being scared and into being really excited because we are, we're getting the staff hired. We've got some great people starting even next week during a holiday week who are gonna help us move forward um, all the new programs. So this is a lot. So I will just give a little brief summary of local housing aid um, and how the legislature invested in local governments this year. Um, and definitely check out the links um, if you are not familiar with what these resources look like. So a many hundreds of millions of dollars program passed this year that is um, state wide local housing aid, so all of the counties in Minnesota, and then greater Minnesota cities at the thresholds around 10,000, um, are receiving appropriated aid in buckets that start uh, about a week from now, December 1, um, and that first payment will, will go to communities. Unlike most Minnesota housing programs where I mentioned, you know, we set up a competition, rules of the competition, rules of monitoring, this is a direct appropriation like other local aid. So the legislature and the Department of Revenue will send that money straight to the coffers of the communities. In two and a half years, you'll report back to Minnesota Housing, if you're with you know, a city or county government receiving the aid, what you did with it. That sounds great. I don't think anyone wants a gotcha situation where you report to us a couple years later and we say, oh, that wasn't eligible. So I am staffing up for technical assistance for this so that we can be supportive to local communities and your goals, you know, how regional efforts are enhancing the work, um, and you know, make sure that we're drawing connections between how you might leverage state and local funds to uh, Minnesota Housing's other programs. So we will have technical assistance staff, even though we don't set the rules. This is a legislative program, um, and you know, we really want to make sure this is successful. I know that every advocate who got up to the Capitol to talk about this money wants to make sure it's successful because um, if it's not, it won't continue. This was an appropriation, it's, I think it's four years of money, which is great. Uh, but if you know, we look back and are like, eh, no one really spent it, they were, it was confusing, you know, it felt um, overwhelming or it wasn't enough in some communities to really leverage the kinds of work that was on the list, um, it won't succeed. So we, we really want to support it. Uh, in the metro, there's a sales tax that will increase the uh, city and county amounts, but that's not until next year. And um, we have appropriated resources that are very similar and will be run by our same team at Minnesota Housing um, that will be led by Jennifer Bergman from Brainerd. Many of you know her, so I think everyone gets happy when I say that's who's joining us to run this work. Um, but also that uh, is voucher assistance to add about 5,000 Section 8 Housing Choice voucher type, but state-funded vouchers across the state. And then um, my last slide, I know it's quite a lot. There are also new grant programs that Jennifer Bergman's team will run that are brand new, um, and that includes tier two cities is less than 10,000. Um, and so, you know, it's not as much money, but these are cities that aren't benefiting from the statewide local housing aid who can compete for um, the uh, tier two cities grants. Local housing trust funds, these are matching grants, and the Northland Foundation is also getting support to help communities with their technical assistance on local housing trust funds. Um, so where a city has set up a trust fund and the, the matching grant funds can help to enhance that pool of resources. 
Greater Minnesota Housing Infrastructure Grants, and this is greatly needed and talked about a lot at the Capitol. This is another one where I'd hope to prove a lot of success so we can um, continue to win these resources at the Capitol. Um, this is a matching grant. I'm pretty sure it's up to 500,000, it's in the bill, um, but that uh, if cities and communities bring other non-state resources, it's matching to basically build the neighborhood, bring in the streets, the street lights, the utilities, ahead of an, a development that will uh, support affordable housing. And then lead safe homes grants, um, just trying to really increase the resources in the public health realm. Um, and local governments are generally the target of these resources to then subgrant and kind of find the right way to deploy the lead remediation. So those are my slides. I think we'll come back um, with some uh, questions and answer type sessions, and I will hand it back uh, to Commissioner Vice Chair. Curtis Vine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that legislative uh, overview. Uh, I'm now turning to Ms. Brennan, and my same question without my fanfare, is it okay if I call you Andrea? Absolutely, Mr. Vice Chair, Commissioner Mortensen. <laughs> I knew that was gonna come to harm. <laughs> Can, uh, can, well, can you tell us about uh, the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund and uh, addressing its mission and core programs? Uh, absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Brennan, President and CEO of Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. I'm very excited to be here this morning. I'm really happy to see the, um, the really great work that's underway here in Otter Tail and um, very impressive. It's really hard to follow 1.3 billion, though. I'm a little disappointed in the ordering of the speakers here. So <laughs> I think we needed more lead up to that. Um, so what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, um, give you a high level overview so that you can have a sense of, of where we may be able to be helpful um, to Otter Tail in achieving your housing goals. So Greater Minnesota Housing Fund was established in 1996 by two foundations, Blandin Foundation up in Grand Rapids and uh, McKnight Foundation, which is located in the metropolitan area. Um, we, were, uh, we were created specifically as, um, and Rachel mentioned this earlier, inter intermediary. So what an intermediary really means is that the foundations wanted to support the creation of a nonprofit that would have housing expertise that could really just, broadly speaking, tend to um, the ecosystem for housing in the state and identifying where there are needs. So are there funding gap needs? Are there research and development needs? Um, and so throughout the, the 26 years that we've been in existence, GMHF has um, played many, many roles. Um, really, it's kind of as needed. Additionally, GMHF um, at, at, was created as a nonprofit intermediary also to be supportive of um, government. So um, Commissioner Jennifer Ho appoints one of the members of the GMHF board and we, um, we are also here to support the deployment of $1.3 billion, um, support the state and their efforts and, and also local government as well, cities, towns, um, tribal communities. And then finally, GMHF is also a community development financial institution, uh, CDFI, and that is a specific designation um, through the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, and it was this CDFI um, network was really created, this concept was created in the mid-1990s um, as a strategy to create a national network of community development banks, lending institutions rather, um, that would um, lend where or invest where um, communities um, have been underserved by lending institutions or for just the kind of community development um, work that um, doesn't really, is, isn't really supported by conventional market rate lending like small business development, like affordable housing. So that is our, um, why we were created. Um, here's our mission. Our mission is around strong communities which require affordable housing. Uh, the impact that we've had over the last, um, throughout our existence, um, we have invested um, $1 billion in 27 years. <laughs> uh, 
statewide, um, serving two, more than 200 communities and supporting more than 20,000 housing units, um, both preservation and new construction. And this one billion of investment has leveraged three billion um, from, from other sources. And that is a really key role that um, GMHF and CDFIs in general play, is our ability to um, raise capital. So, um, you know, raise capital and deploy it in ways that really help fill gaps and support housing needs in Minnesota. So this, this slide gives you kind of an, a, a picture of our annual, um, and this has really ratcheted up in recent years. Uh, so, um, you know, if you add up 100 million of annual funding times 27 years, we'd be in a little different situation. So we've really grown as an organization. Our financial strength has grown, and, and our, our staffing and our ability to really um, support uh, affordable housing throughout the state has grown too. So these are our four sort of key buckets. Um, so way over to the um, over to your right, um, grant making. Uh, as we were created by philanthropy, um, we were at first created as these intermediaries to sort of take grants from philanthropy and then re-grant them for community purposes. Um, we still do that activity. It's a smaller percentage of what we do, um, but we still do make direct grants, again, to support statewide efforts around affordable housing. And then um, we also, the bulk of what we do is really in, in lending. So our lending is um, about 60 to $80 million a year. Um, in the last couple of years, it's actually been double that uh, on an annual basis. We've created a couple of newer sort of subsidiary um, funds that are, are, are specifically focused on, on different initiatives. So in green is the Minnesota Equity Fund. And that fund is um, was, was created uh, in the late 2000s or around 2010-11. And the purpose was to support housing developments um, that need tax credits. So t um, housing projects that receive low income housing tax credits um, in smaller and rural in um, underserved communities, it can be and, and definitely was in 2010, really difficult to attract those, those um, tax credit investors. And so GMHF, um, really at the urging of the, the, the state housing commissioner at the time, um, created an, an equity fund. And what we do is we raise capital through, um, through those that want to invest in, in, um, in, uh, in, tax, in these tax credits. Um, one, of our, one of our biggest investors is United Health Group. Um, and then we then um, you know, purchase these credits to then, that can then be used to finance affordable housing. So Minnesota Equity Fund um, has been in, you know, it, it has been in operation um, since then. Um, and then more recently, we created the NOAA Impact Fund. And NOAA stands for Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. Um, the idea here is that it is more cost effective to preserve the housing we have than it is to build new housing. So we can't just build our way out of this affordable housing crisis, we have to do both. Yes, we have to build, and yes, we have to preserve. So the NOAA Impact Fund um, was actually um, created by Rachel Robinson when she was at Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. Um, it's a really innovative um, way to, again, leverage capital. So GMHF have invested money, um, Minnesota Housing has invested money, we have local banks, we have some philanthropic funding, so we create this fund that then can basically act in place of private equity. So, um, which means that we can, um, we can invest through the NOAA Impact Fund in NOAA Preservation um, at much, much more concessionary or lower um, it, like interest rate, lower rate return expectations. So all that means is that there isn't pressure to increase rents. So we can preserve affordability while investing in quality and preserve these really important units. And then um, again, these are our priorities. We um, uh, really across the continuum of affordable housing, home ownership, rental, ending, and preventing homelessness. And, um, and then we have three 
Um, currently, we have three uh, initiatives that we've focused a lot of time and energy on. Um, the first is our Emerging Developer of Color program. I'm not going to talk about this because I don't want to steal Irene's thunder. She's here and she's going to be on a panel at 115. Um, but this is a way to really support um, emerging developers in um, throughout the state to, um, again, build the overall capacity of developers in communities so that um, we can just strengthen our ability across the state to do more in affordable housing. Um, the second one is um, housing and health equity initiative. Uh, this was a, launched um, about a year and a half, two years ago, where GMHF invited uh, major healthcare systems in the state to be part of a cohort, a learning cohort. So we have six of these systems that have been learning um, with us for the last, um, and together for the last year around the importance of housing as the key, one of the most important social determinants of health. And healthcare systems also have the ability to make investments in affordable housing. And so one of, um, one of the, the benefits, what we're realizing through this initiative is we are starting to see more interest in healthcare systems and really um, making investments in housing as upstream solutions um, and supporting that key social determinant of health in an upstream way. And then finally, another initiative that we um, just recently launched through a grant with the Blandin Foundation is our um, rural capacity building initiative. So we are focusing this effort in the Leech Lake and Grand Rapids, Itasca County area. Um, but at the same time, we are trying to take learnings as we go and apply those to other communities across the state. And what's different here and the way that we're approaching it, um, which is the timing couldn't be better with all of the um, new resources that uh, you know are being made available through the state is um, is to really just not just focus on units and increasing the number of units, but really thinking about the broader ecosystem, including workforce, including labor, including um, developer capacity, including um, you know not just thinking about the next deal, but like a, a much more robust pipeline of. Um, projects and uh, along with, um, and that's what's so impressive about seeing this room so full, um, the importance of coalition building and um, growing and building that public will to support uh, affordable housing because, um, you know, yes, some of the, the challenges are daunting and they're not impossible. And so with, with new state resources and um, I think, you know, supporting um, community-based uh, development around affordable housing, I, I'm just incredibly optimistic about what we can accomplish together. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, turning to Ms. Baldwin, and will Amy work? Uh, I'm sorry. Are we on? Yeah. Okay. You are on. I, and I'm asking, can, being consistent here, uh, in terms of uh, identifying panelists, will Amy work moving forward? Yeah. Uh, can you describe what resources the county can bring to housing projects and what are the county's priorities? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so you know, you've, you've heard about the, the big build, I mean, the overall initiative, but wanted to take a little time just to walk through um, some of our specific resources and what our needs are. Um, to help kind of inform the day and, and then how we can layer in with what we just heard from Rachel and Andrea. So as we, as we look to support housing uh, investment and growth and, and reinvestment across the county, we really take our, our first layer uh, is to be additive and supportive to what is happening. And that might be um, you know, how we just start talking about it. Even with our financial participation, how can we be you know, leverage money or you know, help bring in other resources because it does take a lot. We work with our communities and partners to identify the opportunities. What are the needs in your particular community? What, you know, what are the dynamics at play within your community and how can we activate those opportunities? Again, looking at resources and, um, you know, and our goal is, is uh, you know, simply, you know, talking about Minnesota housing and looking at, you know, we have our big, big goal, but also, you know, we want everyone to find home in Ottertail County and that looks different for different people and want to make sure that there is a place for everyone to find home here. Uh, 
at our last summit, we uh, launched a lot of data. We shared a lot of data around um, housing needs in Otter Tail County. And while that was a year and a half ago, and we've made progress, you know, our, our big themes of needs uh, remain the same um, around that. We do have copies of this map in the back on the resource table if you want to dig in. But if, is for those who um, have seen this information, we looked at a submarket region uh, around the state or around the county, uh, five different submarkets. Knowing our communities and our areas are different as we look around and, and there are a lot of communities. So we looked at kind of chunks of that um, and what the needs were within there um, for different housing types. So, but across the board in all of those submarkets, even though we broke it down, it really uh, drilled down to three key areas of housing. So that entry level owner or active senior ownership option for new housing um, that might be in the form of a traditional single family home, twin home, town home, uh, but that was a high need. Uh, market rate rental, both for our workforce population and our seniors who might be looking to uh, move over in a housing product. And we know um, that it's really important to have that, that churn or that flow of folks through a housing product. And if there isn't anywhere for our seniors to move to, whether it's that active senior ownership or a rental opportunity, um, we're not opening up that starter home for another family to come in that might be more affordable to them. And then uh, the third area being affordable uh, general occupancy or, or you know, rental, as well as senior affordable rental. And uh, again, across the board, high needs in all of those areas. Um, it, so then shifting from our needs to what those resources look like, I mentioned already, we try to leverage them. Um, we, we also act as a convener, you know, in this sense today and other, other activities, but also to be a connector to resources. We have, you know, there are a ton um, of resources and more coming and we wanna make sure we're connecting and um, helping folks leverage those resources as well as provide technical assistance and help think through what might be a structure. Um, there was a, a project in a community that initially was going to use tax increment financing. Ultimately, they, they shifted to tax abatement because that just worked better for um, various reasons, but helping to think about that and what is the best structure for a project. And then um, we've grown in our work to be able to now offer uh, financial resources. We have, we have cash, we have dollars too that we want to deploy and, um, and get out into the community, hopefully to leverage some of these other resources or, or to get a project up to being ready for um, accessing these other resources. And then the newest area, newest role we're playing is in direct development. And I mentioned that earlier with the Hidden Meadows project in Battle Lake being our first entree into, we built three single family homes through our Housing and Redevelopment Authority with the financial support um, of uh, Minnesota Housing to make that happen. And we sold our last one just uh, under three weeks ago, about three weeks ago. So great to see those three new homes up and occupied by households um, and thinking about what that what that looks like. Um, and then we're looking at, at where else can we play that active role. We'll talk about that in the opportunities session um, in, in a bit of where we do have some additional uh, work that we're doing in that more direct development realm on that. So I wanted to just quickly walk through some of those financial resources. Um, there is a flyer on each of, um, set out on the tables there that says housing resources, financial resources. Um, and we put that together to kind of bucket the three areas where we do um, financial support and where we have programs. Um, the first one, which is actually on the back side of the program, is uh, our funding that's direct to our cities, to the communities, um, you know, through the, the, the structure, the organization of the city, so a, an individual can't apply, but our cities can. And there's a number of areas that folks can apply for, for dollars. Uh, they do require a match, but we've been able to um, deploy out a, a number of really, really exciting um, uh, support projects. So um, everything from the pre-development planning, getting that local housing study done to really affirm what types of housing um, you know, is needed most in your community and help you guide your efforts to um, public infrastructure financing. We've approved two grants now uh, to support new infrastructure extensions uh, one is, is um, well, underway and, and moving and, and others are, are getting ready to go. Uh, redevelopment efforts, we have acquisition, um, demolition, you know, funding we can again help, help 
remove those barriers to redevelopment. And then of course, affordable housing and how we can um, either be a match or, or help spur a project moving forward on that. So again, those are direct for our communities. Um, in, just to note, um, because of the funding source and some jurisdictional components, these programs aren't available in Fergus Falls presently. So, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, so just to mention that, um, that they are available throughout the balance of the county. Um, so for our builders and landlords, we offer a gap loan program um, to help again with that. Um, you know, we know interest rates are really impacting some of our multifamily projects. If we can come in and do deferred or low interest loans, again, to help get that project underway, we can be flexible in what our programs look like. And then also the rehab side for our existing rental, we wanna make sure we're investing in that existing housing stock and uh, ensuring that it remains um, quality and um, good for the, the tenants in there. Um, and again, low interest on that, interest rates are, are um, we don't want that to be a barrier, so we, we really look to, to make those funds accessible. And then finally, for our home buyers and homeowners, uh, we currently offer down payment assistance. We're really excited to be able to uh, promote and leverage the state's resources that have um, uh, greatly expanded going forward. Um, also looking at our um, uh, rehab of, of our existing owner-occupied uh, structures, and then we do offer emergency repair uh, to help make sure, again, those homes are safe and, and uh, habitable for all of our residents. So just a snapshot, I mean, we, we have some flexibility within these resources too, but wanted to just get those high-level uh, programs out and, and in a consumable way that you can take with you today. Um, so those were the, the balance of my remarks. I'll turn it back to Commissioner. Thank you, Amy. Uh, back to Rachel, one program that received significant funding in this past legislative session was workforce housing. What does a community need to be ready to apply for the Greater Minnesota Workforce Housing Program? I did turn it off, it's back. Okay, so um, we do use the word workforce quite a bit in uh, Minnesota housing because a lot of our housing, affordable, or market rate is serving our workforce in Minnesota. But we have a really excellent program run by my colleague, Sarah Bunn. You can find her info on our website. Um, that is our workforce program for greater Minnesota. And the need that it is addressing is that across greater Minnesota and the region we are in right now, we have strong economies and high employment, um, you know, big employers who have, uh, you know, good paying jobs, but the market isn't supplying uh, rental or even home ownership that you know is going to work for the workers, and so we have a program where most of what we do at Minnesota Housing is trying to get the rent or home ownership rate below market. This is actually to build housing at market, um, but to acknowledge that some subsidy or uh, support is necessary to get the you know to cover the development costs of building new market rate housing. So Sarah gave me some kind of talking points about, you know, if you're thinking about this, if you know there's a need, it's about understanding who is your workforce. Um, are they younger? Are they gonna have their families living with them? Um, what might be their expectations of their housing community in terms of amenities? Um, you know, how big uh, are you, is, you know, your housing study telling you you need 10 units or 100? And, you know, to start preparing for, um, you know, how you might approach a housing development this is still a relatively new program for us and it continues to grow and evolve. And Sarah is really good at listening to um, communities in greater Minnesota that are eligible for this program about what their needs are and how the program can best serve um, the communities. Because this really, the intent has always been um, to build housing that works for workers making you know, good wage rates at area employers who are coming to the community to find they can't find anywhere to live. And that's just not, you know, that's not good for our economies. That's not good for uh, growth of our housing in Minnesota. So it's um, a really important program. It's been really successful, but definitely sort of getting into that. Who are we talking about? What do they need? Um, you know, what rate would they really be able to, to afford or expect to pay in this market? Uh, and then call Sarah Bunn and get some technical assistance because she's very um, happy to do so. Yeah, if I can add, just it was one of the slides that Rachel showed earlier, but the, the increased investment in this program was substantial. It previously was around, I mean, two million a cycle or so, yeah, I think, four million. million. Yeah. yeah. 
and it's 40 million. So that it, 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 in that it was really demonstrated in the volume of applications um, that were received through this program in the past. And you know, our employers talking about that need that, that Rachel just described. So we, uh, there are projects that have used this program in Ottertail County uh, um, and they've been successful and, and have brought good housing products so if there are any communities that will be a funding round coming up in probably the first quarter of next year, I think is what I heard Sarah say. Yeah, Sarah's working speak. on getting yeah. around with um, some evolution of the program yeah. to match the size, scale, and needs, and yeah. construction costs and interest rates, which are impacting. Yes. Yeah, making program. it even more challenging, yeah. So I just wanted to add that just for a little context locally. Andrea, same, uh, same topic. How do Greater Minnesota fund programs support workforce housing? And also at some point, if you could touch on monetizing a tax uh, increment financing notes. Isn't this exciting? Talking about monetizing tax increment financing. Now, I love this room. I love this crowd. Um, usually when I, you know, at parties, people's eyes tend to glaze over when I talk about these kinds of things. but. Um, yes, absolutely. So when, uh, you know, the, and, and a lot of this is very kind of deal by deal specific. And so um, when you're calling Sarah Bunn, also call GMHF and we can sit down and talk about your project. That's how we work best is just that one on one really understanding the project and um, what financing is needed, what financing is already secured. But some examples of the work that, that GMHF does with its lending is um, we provide many forms of lending. So we provide pre-development lending, we provide construction lending, and construction lending really is, um, all that means is that you're paying for the construction until all the permanent sources come in. There are a lot of permanent sources um, or a lot of sources for the housing development that don't actually come in until the project is done. Um, and so we do construction lending. And this is a, um, we, we are finding that there's a growing um, sort of opportunity for partnership between our organization as a CDFI lender and local banks. Are there any lenders in the room? Any bankers in the room? Um, not to, you know, to call you out, but um, that there's also an opportunity we have found that there are lenders who want to make um, investments in affordable housing developments. And we have found ways to do that through participation lending. So we, um, we provide construction lending and then, you know, we do all the underwriting, we do all of the sort of work of providing this loan and then as a CDFI and for affordable housing, and then based on certain geographic areas, <clears throat> lenders or banks can qualify for um, CRA or Community Reinvestment Act credit. And so this can be a really beneficial partnership for both the affordable housing development, workforce housing development, um, I'm using them interchangeably in the context of this question, um, and, uh, and the CDFI lending and, and local um, lending institutions. And usually what we do is we ask the bank to participate in 45% of the loan, and then, um, and then we do the rest, and it's a win-win-win it's a kind of situation. So um, we would certainly extend that invitation to um, any, any workforce development um, or affordable development that is happening in, in this area. Related to tax increment financing, oftentimes, um, and, and I can't emphasize enough what an important tool this is, um, for for development of housing, and um, both um, both cities, counties, um, you know, redevelopment authorities, uh, um, allowing or you know, supporting tax increment financing. Um, oftentimes, it's in the form of pay as you go. So as those taxes come in, then the local unit of government um, provides them back to the project, and um, so someone has to capitalize or monetize that upfront. And we have done that for, for many developments, really. And we, what we, we typically do that in the context of the first mortgage. So we also do first mortgage lending. Um, thankfully, we have a really strong partnership with Minnesota Housing. They have a lot more money than we do. And so often we will um, do a first mortgage loan. And then um, we will, Minnesota Housing will take that off our hands, give us cash, and we'll go make more loans. So that's a really good partnership that we have. And um, we do not shy away from TIF. We absolutely um, want to be helpful. Um, and that's one of the value adds I think that we bring as a CDFI lender is our willingness 
to um, monetize that future stream of tax increment payments so that we can bring that capital to the project to help support the development of it. Uh, thank you. Um, back to Amy. How significant is the need for workforce housing in Otter Tail County? Well, yeah, it's, it's significant. I think we've, we've talked about that, um, you know, in both the rental and the, that entry-level ownership product as well. Um, you know, we want to think about, um, you know, how, how do we create strong communities? And, and there are 21 communities in Otter Tail County. It's a big county, um, and we have a lot of great employment across the county, a lot of great um, you know, places, I just, I've, I've got, we've got the best view. Sorry, guys, you're all facing us. But we're, you know, looking out at, you know, and just thinking about, you know, where, who, you know, who we are as a county. And I talked earlier about, you know, we have this effort to push, um, you know, to, to bring people to the county. And that is also driven by, while we're growing in a population of a county, we, we, we continue to grow, but our available labor force is declining as folks age out of the workforce. And so um, we've got to be really strategic about making sure we have the workforce housing, the, the available housing aligned with, with the incomes, with the um, desires and, and aligned with the needs of, of folks looking for housing. And so it's, um, it, it's constant and, and it looks, again, it looks different um, in different communities. Some have had you know, good success in getting multifamily, but really have struggled with the single family. Some have gotten the single family, but struggled with the multifamily. And so, you know, we want to think about that across across the community, and it looks different in different areas. But the need is there um, in all the communities. So, yeah. Thank you. This next question is addressed to the entire panel, and we can use the same uh, sequence in terms of uh, responding to the question. But. Uh, how is your organization addressing the challenges of entry level home ownership and why is that important? Yeah, I'm sure you all know the problem that we have structurally across the state, every corner. There are not enough entry level homes that, um, that structurally that just doesn't work. It costs more pretty much everywhere in the state to build a new home than that market price for that home. So. A three bedroom, two bath, uh, new construction, you know, don't be surprised if you're penciling that out and you see a number starting with a four or higher uh, in this market. And um, that's the reality. It's really uncomfortable. We don't have a solution for the construction costs of Minnesota housing. I don't, I don't have a way to fix that, but we do have our resources to figure out how to address the supply problem. Um, I wish we could go even faster. We do have $1.3 billion, which really helps make a difference. But when it comes to building new and adding homes and communities um, that are going to be affordable to uh, you know, first-time home buyers, we have a number of programs through our Single Family Impact Fund that help to write down that difference between the construction cost and the market price, as well as the difference between the market price and what a moderate or low-income homeowner could afford. And those are grant programs because it really is about just you know, closing that gap and figuring out how we actually get these homes built across Minnesota. Um, and so you know, we're continuing to make a dent in the supply. It is a big structural problem that unless construction costs and interest rates just magically adjust, is going to continue to be a problem. So uncomfortable, but if you're looking at this, uh, at new homes in your community and you're like, well, that construction cost seems unreal, give us a call, let's do technical assistance. Um, you know, don't give up because that's the reality that we're all living in right now. And um, it doesn't matter where you are in the state, everyone's feeling it. And that's why we don't see the market providing these single family homes. So we, we do have a legislature that's really motivated to continue to try to do production, help on the supply side. We also have a lot of work happening in the um, homeowner side to help homeowners uh, who are, if you're out in the market right now trying to buy, you're looking at interest rates um, that are you know, double, triple what they would have been just a few years ago, and the cost to close is really high. So we have a lot of assistance. We've always had our first time home buyer programs at Minnesota Housing that come with down payment and closing cost assistance, and we've um, bumped those numbers up of the amount of grant per household or loan per household to help um, adjust with the market as things continue to just get more expensive. And then we have um, some really wonderful new programs, both at Minnesota Housing and across our communities that um, we might hear from the other panelists too, that 
our um, down payment assistance to just help households uh, you know, get their mortgage down to an, a number that's affordable for them. So at the legislature this year, it's $150 million. Um, 100 is in community-based down payment assistance. That's um, up to 10% of the home or 32,000 per household for first generation home buyers. So these are home buyers where the home buyer and their parent um, are not homeowners and um, are getting into home ownership. That wealth gap has you know, created a problem for that household. They don't have a family um, that has been able to build wealth in home ownership and they're trying to get into home ownership and become um, someone who can build wealth. That's a really important uh, program. So one is community-based. Um, the parent organization for that is Midwest Minnesota CDC out of Detroit Lakes. And then our agency has 50 million. Um, similar structure, slightly different, 10%, 35,000, I think is the top. Um, so we're getting those programs out uh, as quickly as we can into the market. The lenders are a big part of that. If you are one of our lenders in our network um, or MMCDC's networks, you know that it's about um, you know, the uh, soup to nuts realtors all the way through the home buyer um, to help a successful close that includes down payment assistance. And there's layering because there's a number of community philanthropy efforts out there. Um, really, everyone is identified. When we talk about wealth and disparities, particularly for black, indigenous, and households of color, um, owning a home makes a huge difference in uh, accruing wealth over a lifetime. And it's a place where we can do better for all Minnesotans by supporting home ownership. Uh, thank you. And Andrea, challenges of uh, uh, entry level home ownership, just repeating the question. Sure, thank you. Uh, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund's uh, lending products also can be used for home ownership development. Um, and we, we do use them in that way. Uh, an example um, of that lending is, is, again, construction financing. And again, one of our strengths is, um, is, is really leveraging more capital. And so we provide, because we have all of these systems built already, we have the ability to, if there are local lenders, local investors, local like you know folks who want to make a um, doesn't even have to be like a grant or a philanthropic investment, but um, you know maybe want to invest in affordable housing and want some return, and maybe are willing to take a little bit of a lower than market rate return on an investment. We can take that funding and we can package it into loan products that could help build um, affordable and workforce housing in your community, whether it be home ownership or whether it be um, rental housing. And so that's, um, again, an open invitation. Another um, area that I wanted to emphasize, and again, um, hopefully you'll hear more on this specifically from um, Irene Brisseno Ruiz on my team, who's here and talking at 115. She leads the Emerging Developer of Color program. And when you think about the you know, developer shortages and the labor shortages, and it's, um, you know, and, and, and think about the innovation in helping to expand the, the world of um, developers in this space, uh, this can be a really important um, a, like way to both um, you know, support workforce, entrepreneurship, small business, and support the production of housing because um, you know, while it may, it, it takes a different level of developer sophistication, for example, to take on a multifamily um, low-income housing tax credit development with 687 forms of financing in it than it does to build a single-family home. So that kind of development, um, or, or a, I should say a duplex or you know, a, a twin home or whatever it is, I mean, that kind of smaller scale development can really lend itself to that whole area of emerging developers. And so one of the things that GMHF does is we, we support these emerging developers on a statewide basis. So we can provide technical assistance, we can provide um, capacity building grants, um, pre-development loans to, again, a lot of times it, it, it's a big hurdle to get over um, as an emerging developer to have the working capital to be able to even like get a project up and running. So those are ways that we, um, we you know, we bring, I think, ser important services that really are, lend themselves more um, to that kind of smaller scale development that can be um, used for entry level housing. The other area um, that we've focused a lot on is really partnerships with um, with longer term affordable kind of mechanisms like community land trusts um, 
and and um, supporting their development uh, through different kinds of lending, financing, but also um, affordability, affordability gap um, loans, which essentially are down payment assistance loans to again make sure that they can serve a lower income um, population in the housing that they build. Thank you. Amy, can you recap uh, local resources for home buyers and uh, development for single family sure. so, um, ownership homes? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, just to echo a couple things though that, that um, I heard just now, you know, that one of the most common things we hear around single family is well, it costs too much to build. You know, I can't, it, I can't sell it for, you know, what it costs. I mean, that's that is such a common message and um, challenge there. Or um, conversely, on the the communities who might have sites that are ready, there isn't a, a developer in the area that might be looking at the scale or be be connected within that area. So really good um, resources to think about. And uh, you know, we. We have some limited local resources. These gaps are pretty big in some communities, in some instances, you know, um, seeing again that single family home price, um, even in a, a moderate home of the high threes to four is what we're seeing. And I'm sure it's not news to, to folks in the room, um, but when you're going to sell it, that's, that's not the number. So we can help to a degree. We have um, uh, some limited value gap funding um, it does have to be matched with a local city partner um, or through another funding stream to bring that in. Um, we, you know, we become more active in that role. We're um, advancing a, a project in Pelican Rapids that will be entry level single family. That's going to be a redevelopment TIF district, um, but we're, it's going to require other resources as well. That isn't enough to cover the gaps um, to make that project. Um, pencil out, you know, we're, we're in the same boat. We're not looking for a return on our investment um, from a government perspective, but we do need to work to um, make sure we can finance the whole, um, all the components of it. So our down payment assistance is available. Um, we work with, you know, we, and when these new resources kind of come more online, I know um, MCCD in Detroit Lakes has been starting to push out some um, preliminary communication that, you know, they'll be a big partner and we're really lucky to have them in our backyard um, geographically close and connected um, to hopefully push out those resources and, and get them leveraged locally to get more people into a home ownership position and you know know that we can be that resource to kind of there's a lot of stuff out there so if um, you know if you have if you're a lender or a realtor and you have a buyer who just has that gap you know we can help try to identify what is a fit for that buyer to to get them into that home. Uh, just a note here for the audience, I'm going to be asking the panelists one more question, and we should have a short period of time for some questions, so get your questions ready. Uh, when we get to that point, raise your hand and we'll have a microphone that'll come to you for the questions. Uh, moving on to the last question, how is your organization addressing the challenges of affordable uh, senior housing? And Rachel, if you could include in your response. Uh, addressing housing infrastructure bonds. I can, I can start um, okay. if that. So, you know, I mentioned in our, our top three needs, um, affordable senior rental. And if you look at the data within currently in Otter Tail County, over half of our seniors who rent are what's called cost burdened. They are paying too much for their rent and it's impacting how they can pay for their food and medicine and other components of their life that they need to. And so it is a really important challenge that we need to work together on. Um, so we have taken another role as, as um, at trying to advance um, at a community-based level. So looking at our small communities, we, we talked to folks, we engaged with, with local residents, and you know they want to stay where they are. They don't, I mean, you know, there are other, you know, more regional centers they could move to but they might want to stay in one of those 21 communities um, where they've lived and raised and may have community support um, and connections and social connections, et cetera. So we are, uh, through our Housing and Redevelopment Authority, moving forward with a model of creating the right scale of housing. So, you know, maybe six units, tr looking at triplexes as what that solution would be. So residentially designed um, for more of a single family neighborhood and bringing um, that housing that we would then own and operate, add to our portfolio that we currently own and bring that product 
um, again, at that community level. But then also working with our, our what I'll say, larger communities in you know, what would a larger scale project look like and how can um, you know, a partner locally be brought in to, to bring um, that product in because they're also living someplace now, so we would be opening up other housing, get them into a more appropriate um, housing product, single level, potentially coming from a single family home, et cetera. So again, I mentioned the churn earlier, but that um, in our mind, one, it's a, just a serious need that's gonna continue to grow as our population grows here in Ottertail County and, and across the state and nation. Um, but we wanna try to do, you know, play a role in that uh, directly. So that's um, an effort we're advancing. Thank you, Amy, and I apologize for the, to the panelists for mixing up the order of those questions. Uh, now turning to Rachel. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, for decades, Minnesota housing didn't do any senior housing. In fact, most of the life of our organization, and the theory being that the federal government did senior, we didn't do senior because the federal government did it. And you all work in this field, you know that that hasn't been true in a really long time. Um, you know, so many cities across greater Minnesota have that one publicly owned senior building that was built with HUD funds and is a wonderful community full of uh, seniors, a great place to visit, um, but there's nothing new that's in that affordable realm. Um, and, you know, we're doing work to invest in updating and renovating those older HUD uh, funded buildings. So Minnesota housing, you know, has really been coming around on how we do senior housing, in part because the legislature has this wonderful resource that's called sometimes housing infrastructure bonds in a year where we literally sell the bonds. And this year with um, the budget surplus is straight cash appropriations to the agency, but still under that housing infrastructure um, category. It's our largest funding program on a dollar basis. And um, part of that is carved out for senior. Um, it's still so newish to the agency. Most of what has been funded, if you look back a few years, is metro larger developments. And so it's really about starting to figure out that engagement between Minnesota housing and communities that are looking at that smaller scale uh, senior development, you know, that's uh, sized right for um, the communities you're in. And seniors who are on fixed incomes, where rental assistance may be a really important component of helping seniors stay in that home and stay stable, uh, you know, an age in place, as we say. So we, we definitely do have resources more and more over time, and um, uh, it's a, a great place to, to see the work, and we'd love to see more in greater Minnesota in our proposals. Thank you, Andrea. Could you address the Housing and Health Equity Initiative? Yes, thank you. I've touched on this earlier, so I'll just add a little bit of uh, color to it. The uh, Housing and Health Equity Initiative is, is relatively new at GMHF, and um, we, we don't, um, you know, our, our goals for this is really to learn together and to um, broaden the, the coalition, the collective coalition of um, of stakeholders, really, in the affordable housing world. And as you can imagine, the healthcare system um, understands the importance of housing stability um, and the connection to services for, for the aging population. And so this is definitely an area of strong interest across the healthcare systems. And um, I think a really great opportunity to think innovatively around uh, new investment capital and new partnerships and um, creative ways, not just of funding construction and housing development, but also in thinking about um, how do we better uh, use the healthcare systems um, to pay for services and to support aging in place um, and the services needed to do that effectively. Um, and I would also add that all of the all of the um, activities that GMHF engages in and provides with lending tools like also absolutely apply to uh, senior housing development as well. Thank you. Questions for the panelists? Just raise your hand, the microphone will come to you. We just had a question about um, your map that you developed for the county in the need. And I was just wondering if you did that in-house or if that was somebody that you, you hired to do that. So the data came from a, a large um, housing needs analysis that we engaged a consultant to do. Um, the, the map that we created was done in-house uh, by Sarah. Uh, 
right here, running our, our technology today. Um, so we wanted to create a snapshot, and so we pulled um, some of the key data points and to, to represent them um, on a, a simple form. So uh, that product we did in-house, but based on uh, data from a consultant. One more question. So as a, maybe a question for some of the lenders in here, if we did have a developer that came into our office and said, hey, I'm willing to um, get involved with the project, would the, uh, the, the assistance, the down payment assistance, are those grants or are they just more lower interest loans? So is it more lending that's gonna happen or is it grants for someone to maybe take some of the, the burden off of the, the gap? So are you talking to me, Dan? I'm just okay. anywhere up there, 1.3 billion. <laughs> All right. So it, we can maybe, Rachel, you want to talk about down payment? Yeah, yeah maybe I might hand it back to Amy too because the packaging of developments that are responsive in your community, that's where you're going to get into your, your local um, development work. Uh, so our programs, um, they can be a bit tough to navigate and that we own that and I think that's where, you know, being connected regionally again is going to be really important. But. Um, if you're in single family home development, uh, we get proposals from developers, we get them from local communities. And um, it's all about you know, finding that sweet spot where the home will be affordable to a homeowner who's maybe at 60 or 80% of area median income. And our programs are designed to work for that community. You know, you're gonna have construction period financing, um, and then uh, these are grant programs generally at the state to buy down the difference between the market price and the affordable price for the household. Um, and we work with our, our partners to package that together so that, you know, we can get the homes, you know, in the ground, uh, under construction, and sold um, to those homeowners because that's really the goal. So just to kind of, yeah, piggyback how we've seen that in, in reality here. Um, so for the development of new single family homes, in, in the most recent case, we did apply for those funds to Minnesota Housing and acted as the developer. But I just want to reiterate what uh, Rachel just said, that developers can directly apply to that program. We can help navigate it and help with you know, our learnings and our knowledge, um, but developers could apply for those dollars, get you know, potentially construction financing, um, the, the value gap, that cost difference in the form of a grant um, to the developer. So um, that just want to reemphasize that. And then it could layer in down payment assistance to the buyer. Could, come into play as well. Yep. And typically our program is deferred um, until sale or refinance um, for the for our down payment assistance. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. I'm I'm wondering about integrated community development where housing happens, you know, with the government and commercial and private housing, you know, is all again it's often called planned unit development, uh, but it's where we start with a uh, small and kind of build around, you know, a planned idea for, you know, expensive housing as well as senior citizen housing and, and, and again, uh, commerce and government working together through de to develop an area rather than just build a house. Sure, so we uh, do support our communities in creating those plans. Um, I briefly mentioned we have pre-development um, planning grants for our communities to access. And that can be if it, you know, for instance, a redevelopment site, that's where probably most potentially what uh, you just described might be taking place or in a, you know, a growth area of a community to help envision what would that look like? What could that mix of housing uh, types, um, different, um, you know, either civic destinations or um, commercial use look like in a planned space? And so that would be a piece that we could help with that um, particularly in a redevelopment sense that our funding could layer in and we could help facilitate um, a community in doing that type of effort. We, we do planned unit developments all the time, um, but also there are some inefficiencies and challenges in the approach because housing agency, we only fund housing. We do not touch anything else. And so if there are other costs or if there are interdependencies between a commercial development and a, um, a housing development, it can get really complex. It definitely happens all the time. Um, but we see everything from who's covering the cost of the list station for you know, the plumbing to um, 
you know, the, the roads, sewers, the infrastructure costs, it can get really complex, but um, developers and cities and counties navigate it pretty well all the time. Yeah. I would just add that um, one of the things that Greater Minnesota Housing Fund has done historically is help support um, research, development, publications, um, highlighting best practices in the community development field. And an example of that is um, we, we um, developed a sort of um, collection of best practices around, we called it building better neighborhoods that talked about, you know, efficient use of land, um, how you can develop um, sort of planned unit um, development type development that would really, um, again, allow for a range of different housing types, but also um, build in some um, more affordability um, or entry level kind of housing based on the design um, principles based on um, you know, and, and uh, along with like the integration of livability and um, and all of that. So we we did that. It, um, it's pretty dated now. It probably needs a refresh. Um, and I, I think the the version today would have um, the aerial would have like solar panels everywhere probably. But um, and then we also did another one that's focused on um, redeveloping better neighborhoods. And so um, like adaptive reuse, like you know a lot of Communities have um, have underutilized properties, like commercial property or schools, are another example that have been converted to affordable housing. So, just thinking innovatively about how space is used and used in ways that um, that you know that do foster and support that kind of integration. One final quick question, so we can get to our break. Yes. Yeah, Amy, I think you mentioned that some of these programs were not available in Fergus, and I don't know if I heard that right. And then my other question is, um, uh, who could talk to how land trusts can be used in communities? So I did mention that uh, some of our financing programs, or the bulk of them actually, are currently not available in Fergus Falls, and our community development uh, doesn't have geographic uh, jurisdiction in that so that's the one of the, the challenge there and that can be addressed um you know in community conversation we just co-sponsored a conference on land trusts it was definitely at least a day worth of uh, material uh, and uh, we see them increasingly used across the state um, and new land trusts being formed that are getting us really good coverage throughout greater minnesota so um, definitely a, a pin in that for uh, more uh, material and, and discussion long term Thank you, panelists, for that vast and valued information here today. Let's give them a round of applause.